And I think to your point, looking at what is, what is the central bank to do in that scenario, right? All they can do is play cleanup. It's not like they can do, try to. <laughs> they don't even have the mechanisms or the visibility to do anything preemptively, um, more but then, or less. But you I can mean, see I, why from, yeah, from Ben Bernanke's perspective, he might look at something like Bear Stearns and think, well, I don't know what to do specifically about collateral or pricing in these markets, but if I bail out Bear Stearns or make it look like Bear Stearns is surviving, mm-hmm. maybe that will calm everybody down. Right. You know, be, maybe if people think I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, I'm going to save individual institutions, then that will that will that will reignite or get people to think, you know, OK, this maybe there is some trust I can mm-hmm. I can depend on. I can sink my teeth into and start to go back toward a normal thing. But, you know, as what you he's doing said, is putting out a small forest fire. Right. <laughs> or just a little corner of a raging conflagration when everybody's yeah. looking at the raging conflagration. Ben Bernanke's over here saying, look, we put out this tree. Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. The whole, the rest of the forest is on fire. Great job, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> That's really what it was. And it's, you know, I think there's even something even more insidious about this. And it's what we just talked about before with opacity and the lack of information is that not only has the Euro dollar system made it harder to look into what's going on, there's a, you know, this, this high degree of quantification mathematics to it that makes it even more difficult for regular people, forget regular right. the lay person's not going to understand the Gaussian Coppola and why that's a big problem. Yeah. It's an even pro- it's an even big problem for people in the system. You've got bank yeah. heads who don't understand what their banks are actually up to. Right. It's a because box. they can't. I mean, they're not the ones down there writing on mathematical equations on the chalkboard. So you don't even right. know what your bank's up to. And central bankers, they have no idea what's going on either. So it's as you said, we've introduced extra elements of complexity that actually make the systems functions that much more remote from the people using and the people depending upon it, because it's almost like you have to have a specialist degree to even understand Mm -hmm. what the hell's going on here. And I can tell you from personal experience, the people who are supposed to know and have these specialist degree, they don't know either. So it's, it's even that much more difficult. And you're right. There's almost like this fourth turning element to it where we convince ourselves, you know, with the further away we get from the last one, you know, the more we've convinced ourselves that we've solved all the world's problems, it's all yes. we've taken care of everything. So we never have to worry about downsides ever again. And, and reinforce by recency bias, confirmation bias, you know, all of the, we start operating in these echo chambers. Um, I think just to tie that to Austrian economics is that, that delayed or suppressed volatility becomes delayed and exacerbated volatility. I think that's the Austrian business cycle theory in a nutshell. It's like every time we print, we try to print over these errors or nationalize um, toxic assets or institutions that we're just kicking the can down the road. Like the market has to clear that error at some point in some way. Right. Um, you can try and smooth right. it with inflation and intervention, but that seems to kick back more often than it gives you a smooth yeah, path. It forward. amplifies the problem where I disagree with the general. I mean, I agree with that, what you just said, mm. but I think people get it wrong is they think the central bank is the one that's done that. Right. They blame the Fed through interest rate mechanism or whatever whatever they can come up with their right. head. They said the Fed is the one that's reduced the you know reduced the amplification of the you know volatility in these marketplaces. When that's not the case, that that money printing, for lack mm-hmm. of a better term, is done by this bank system. Right. This, the Federal Reserve is essentially a bystander, mm-hmm. which is how you get to something like two thousand eight. Because if the central bank was this this effective, all powerful money printer, you never would have had that breakdown to begin with. Right. So, so that's I think. Gets, sorry to interrupt. I just I was going to say no, that I, this gets into your point. I think that this comes again from your writing. Um, the central bank model. This is this is my interpretation of it. And I'll read some excerpts from you. It seems like you've said something to the tune of the central bank model has effectively been forcefully decentralized by the emergence of a euro dollar system. Or maybe to say that differently is the central bank has had steadily less influence on the total global market for money as the euro dollar system has grown. So it's moved from a lender of last resort model to a market of last resort model that's kind of gone around this central institution. And so then the Fed is no longer a central bank, but it's becoming more of a marginal asset buyer. And then the excerpt here I'd like to read is, you said, quote, basically 
this non-central bank, central bank, still tries to act as a circuit breaker under crisis, but employing very different means at very different times, buying impaired assets as markets break down rather than currency elasticity before they do, unquote. So effectively, the Fed becomes this, uh, you know, they're picking winners and losers. They're kind of interrupting the process of capitalism. They're introducing this big uh, source of political noise into the free market dynamics of, of capital allocation and error clearing. Um, but they're not what we've, you know, traditionally believe is some monolithic institution pulling this. They're not the puppet master, or maybe they were the puppet master, but they've really lost control as a result of the euro dollar system. Yeah, and it goes back to that. You know, I think we talked about that before in previous uh, our previous talks that back when the euro dollar system really got in, going in the 50s and 60s, that meant monetary evolution such to the point that central banks realized they couldn't keep up with it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if you can't keep up with money, you can't be a central bank. Mm -hmm. We're talking about central banking along the lines of the Walter Badgett model, which is, you know, lend freely at high rates on good collateral. That's what a central bank yeah. is supposed to do with and they couldn't even define money, right? Like right. not only so can they keep up with it, they can't even define it. Right. How I mean, how is the how is the Federal Reserve going to intervene directly in something like the currency derivatives markets, right? Right. I mean, theoretically, they possibly could. I doubt they could, but you know, theoretically, that's 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 it's not even gonna happen. So it's not really a central bank anymore. And that was proved without a shadow of a doubt. That's what the first global financial crisis was, was basically showing the world that these central banks are not actually central banks. And they knew it. They mm. knew long ago that the monetary system had left them behind. And what they thought they could do was manipulate psychology and behavior such that they wouldn't need to know all this monetary stuff. Mm -hmm. For example, like we just said, if we bail out Bear Stearns and get people to think that's a positive outcome, maybe that will get you know some positive sentiment and still enough trust. We don't have to know about this monetary stuff and collateral shortages and securities mm -hmm. lending. But we'll, we'll have reassured enough dealers that they'll start stepping back into the marketplace and doing all of these various details that we don't know. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes all about psychology. Mm -hmm. And then that didn't really work. It didn't work with Lehman and AIG, obviously. Of course, Lehman, they let go. And AIG, they decided in Wachovia, they decided to bail out. But by then, the system was already too far gone. And since then, they've decided, well, we can't do that. That didn't really work out very well for anybody. So what we'll try to do so we'll try to interrupt these illiquid markets before those prices start to impair dealer activities and trust and things like that. Mm. So if we see that the price of mortgage bonds are going down for reasons that we don't agree with, we think it's illiquid marketplace mm. because we can't we can't create some currency elasticity to stuff in the you know, actual effect of money into those markets. We'll just buy. We'll just start yeah. buying those assets yeah. wow. to raise their price. So that dealers think, oh, there's a dependable mortgage bond price. I don't need to revalue my current, my collateral bulk and things like that. And that's where it becomes not a central bank. It's something very different because a yeah. central bank is supposed to be the circuit breaker at the front of the crisis, whereas this is a sort of kind of a janitor who cleans up right. after the crisis has gotten bad. That's why I use the janitor analogy. So, okay, we can't prevent a crisis, but we can maybe hopefully keep it from becoming really, really bad. Right. And that was that was born in December of 2008 with the first announcement of quantitative easing, where if you actually read through the FOMC minutes for that meeting, it was essentially a surrender. They basically yes. said, we've tried everything up to this point. We don't know what else to do. So we're going to try this other central bank type model, which is not a central bank. And we'll just start buying assets and hope that we'll fix the, the market price, which will no longer be a market price. We'll try to fix the price of these markets, and that will that will be the way in which we can become the circuit breaker, even though it's sort of at the end of the process rather than the beginning. Right, and that's really that's really what the central banks have become, and they call it market of last resort rather than lender of last resort because you can't be lender if you don't know what money is. Right. So the best you can possibly do is market of last resort, which is really, again, it's mostly about psychological effects. Right, and in some ways. It kind of sounds intuitive, like maybe that should work even more effectively than the other way, because if you're raising market prices through purchases, then maybe that would be more effective than trying to just kind of throw blanket money into a, you know elasticity, mm -hmm. that kind of a thing. It sounds like it's even more direct and more honest than the other way, when in fact, it's 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 even worse. It's much worse. 